Remember when I swore off doing ghost adventures reviews on social media? Ah, yes, I did do that. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the non-ghosted channel, even though it's a ghost channel. I'm a little rusty. I've been out of it for a minute. So crazy that so many of you have messaged me on the Facebook page, have messaged me on the YouTube channel, have messaged me, uh, DM'd me on Instagram and said, where have you been, Crystal? Like, you disappeared for two years. Oh girl, I've been there. Okay, I've, I've been here. In fact, I probably uploaded about 50 videos in the past two years that none of you saw. I'm gonna have to talk in code, so I need you to like pick up what I'm putting down. You get what I'm saying? My channel had this thing that's called a shadow to, to you know, something called a ban, and it was because somebody named Laho again to the pahahal get what i'm saying you get where i'm flowing with that yeah it was completely uh invisible to everybody nobody could see me so i ended up deleting about 50 of those videos it was podcasts and things and there was nothing i could do it was out of my control i had complained um you know to youtube and nothing was done but i guess the good news is here we are i had heard through the grapevine that if this had happened to your channel that you could actually remove that um, invisibility by uh, doing some sort of like a YouTube ad. So I was going, I was gonna do the ad, but you guys got notifications before I even had to, to run one. If I could ask you, if you're a loyal fan, please share my videos whenever I upload them as much as possible so that um, we can try to get the channel going again. I would appreciate you so, so much. So yes, welcome back. You think it's been two years, it hasn't. I haven't uploaded in quite a while. I did start a successful podcast that's been going amazing. I stream live on Friday nights through twitch.tv backslash the ghost girl diaries, all one word. And we upload that podcast uh, once a week to um, all major streaming services, including iTunes and Spotify. So yeah, it's been going wonderfully as far as that goes, but I am gonna start doing uploads now that you guys can see my videos. So welcome back to the Ghost Girl channel. It's weird to be back. Like I've been filming another series on my lifestyle channel called Creeps and Cosmetics. If you haven't seen that, you should check it out. I'll put a link below. And uh, basically it's where I do my makeup and while I talk about paranormal stories or like, you know, serial killers and stuff like that. Um, and that's been going well, but I am really happy that this channel is back. I'm laughing because I said I was done doing Ghost Adventures reviews. And to be honest, I, I'm still feeling the same. Insert foot and mouth while I'm sitting here getting ready to do another Ghost Adventures review. Realistically, I'm just trying to branch off and do my own thing. I don't want to be in the shadow of um, Ghost Adventures permanently. So yes, I'm going to do a review tonight because the Cecil Hotel episode was so amazing. Spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the episode, don't watch this video, right? So it was a exclusive episode that streamed to the new Discovery Network, Discovery Plus. P.S. I think Ghost Girl Diaries would work beautifully and perfectly on Discovery Plus. So I'm going to try to get a hold of some producers and people that I know um, under the Discovery umbrella and see if maybe their new streaming network would be interested in Ghost Girl Diaries, the series. Speaking of that, let's back it up a little bit. I actually had a producer reach out to me regarding the Cecil Hotels episode. Also, let's back up even before that. I did 
a video on the Cecil Hotel one time. I will link the old video below. People raked me over the coals for calling it the Cecil. Tomato, tomato, people. Okay? I'm from Colorado. I get like an accent called the Cecil. Who cares? Jesus. It was so crazy because I had such amazing facts in that video and it was so overlooked by people yelling at me because I mispronounced, pronunciated the Cecil Cecil. Whatever, dude. Go eat your tomato, okay? Go have your taco with your tomato with your potato. Anyways. Haters gonna hate no matter what, and that means you've made it when you have haters. So I'm very grateful for the haters. Plus, if people hate on you and leave hateful comments on your YouTube channel, do you know that it just increases your algorithm? So haters want to talk smack while they're on your video, but they're actually helping you. Even the thumbs down, it's helping your algorithm. So boo, you dislike and you complain as much as you want because you're only helping me. Thank you so much. Now let's back it up to 2020. Ugh. Flashbacks and PTSD of 2020 as if the Civil War the other day wasn't bad enough. Um, in 2020, I was contacted by a producer that works with um, Zach's production company and they um, were interested in inviting me on to be a part of episode. I declined. The main reason I think they were inviting me on was A, my video was really big online. It's probably one of the bigger paranormal videos on the um, hotel. But also, um, I've been also trying to get access to the hotel for millennia, like literally forever. So it's interesting. I believe that Zach actually obtained access to the hotel because we're in the middle of a damn pandemic. And, um, or Rona, let's call it Rona, because I don't want any words to be flagged from the algorithm in here. So I think that Rona caused um, their business to go down with the hotel, and um, in return, basically they reached out and said, our, our revenue is really low, do you want to come film with the Travel Channel? And it was like the perfect end, because even Zach said on the episode that he's been begging them to be a part of it for literally years, and I believe that, because I've been begging to get in there to investigate for years as well. So as you guys know, let's just, I have a revamp of notes going through here. 2013 is when Elisa Lamb, 21 student from Canada, disappeared. Um, and Zach literally says right off the bat that it took him 10 years to get access to this location. I believe it because I've been trying to get access to that location as well. I think they've been trying to like bury it under the hatchet for a really long time, like the history, but you can't hide it. The paranormal community, people that are horror lovers, haunted lovers, they like to seek locations like this out. They're probably going to have a bigger revenue after they've like just opened up and let Zach come film there, increase his revenue. And it also makes the um, your property increase in value because it's so like high wanted, high desired um, with a paranormal location in the paranormal community. So February 19th, her body was found in the water tank. On 615 of 2013, her death certificate was marked a accidental death. And then three days later on 61813, it was marked could not be determined. I didn't realize that. So that was really compelling to me. I didn't realize then they scratched it out again before it was actually released to the public. Um, so they must have known something was like fishy and like really irregularly, no one knows what was happening. I'm gonna be honest, just from like, in, you know, energy reading, when I saw that happen in 2013, the first thing I thought was, um, I did think it was somehow related to an entity. Demonic, I don't know. I don't think, like, you know, the Night Stalker was necessarily a demon. I just think he's a really messed up human being. But I do think that in the afterlife, they do have power depending on how how strong they are. And obviously, Elisa, you know, had poor mental health going on. So let's keep talking about it. So I loved and thought it was amazing that Zach got access to the entire location. He's so lucky. Um, I mean, I wish he would have had even more people there to be able to expand it, investigate even more, and find even more footage and evidence while they were there because that's one of those like once in a lifetime opportunities you get an entire location like that. So big, so many floors all to yourself. So two days after she checked into the hotel, and this is also remembered by Skid Row, which is kind of a dangerous part of town. Um, she was assigned to share a room on the fifth floor. However, her roommates complained and the lawyer of the, um, I think the kids that were sharing a room with her said that um, she had a certain quote odd behavior and then she was later moved to a room by herself. Now it, it's come out that 
Elisa was bipolar. So I want to address that too. Now, the interesting thing I didn't know about this was um, they were talking about her clothing was weighed down at the bottom of the tank and it was covered in some sort of sandy substance. So it was heavy and it was like weighted down and she was completely naked inside the tank. Now, I know this is strange, but I didn't hear... I'm going to like look something up really quickly. I just decided to... I'm just going to tell you guys what I'm... I have my laptop like literally like right in front of me right here and I decided to google I said um, Eliza Lamb sexually molested before death because like if her clothing was removed and she was completely naked was why you know what I mean like it, usually if a female is found dead and naked it's because there was like some sort of molestation that went on so I wanted to see um, if there was anything that came up about that I don't see anything it looks like she was just pretty much found like naked and, and floating in the water tank. Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not seeing anything about her. Once again, did the coroners cover that up though? You know what I mean? Let me see if I can find her death certificate. I guess I can pay for it if I need to. It's amazing what Google can do. Okay, her death certificate is online and it is public. So let's just kind of go over this right now. So it says the original screen was disturbed. By, uh, was the original scene disturbed by others? It says no. Hey guys, I was editing the video and I, I stopped editing and decided to do just a little bit more research um, and try to find more information from her autopsy. I have a friend that's going to school to be a mortician and they told me um, that there should be an actual typed up report. So I did a little bit of digging online and I actually found the report. I'd like to read it to you since I didn't include this in my original video. Circumstances, the investigator report from number three, external examination. The body is identified by toe tags and it's that of an embalmed refrigerated adult female Asian who is in moderate de decomposition. She appears the given age of 21 years old. The body weighs about 121 pounds, measures at 66 inches, and she is thin. The skin shows a one inch scar on the right knee and a one fourth round abrasion on the left knee. Wrist scars are absent, tattoos are not present, rigor has been abolished, liver mortis is not a Um, okay, so this is kind of the more important section that I want you guys to pay attention to. Her hair is covered in, or her head's covered in brown hair, it says. There is no balding, and the hair can be described as straight. Examination of the eyes reveals um, they appear to be brown in color, and she does have some white on her eyes. There are no hemorrhages, um, so they're doing just more like visuals. So I'm going to keep fast forward. Upper and lower teeth are present. Dentures are absent. The neck is, is obviously there. There's no chest deformalities. Um, there's no increased anterior posture diameter, which means she's not having any like swelling. The abdominal is flat. Now here's the interesting part. So it says the genitalia are those of an adult female. Um, and obviously red flag if you're squeamish, please uh, don't continue to listen. It says the anus is... Um, E-D-E-M-A-T-O-U-S. And I wanted to look up that in definition. So it says the anus is E-D-E-M-A-T-O-U-S, which is swollen with excessive fluid coming out. Um, so that's what that means from the, like, they're using medical terminology. Um, and if you keep reading, it says that there is pooling of blood around the tissue of the orifice near her anus. The extremities show no edema, no joint formality, abnormal mobility, um, puncture, no punctures, no needle traps. The body's in a state of moderate decomposition with greening of the body, sparring in the lower legs and feet. There is marbling seen on the upper, upper thighs. The scalp and skin and the hair is sloughed, so I'm assuming because she was in the water. Um, the head and face is bloated and bulging, and the eyes are bulging once again, probably from the water. The face shows skin slippage on the forehead. Um, her right cheek is dry and brown in color. So she probably had some sort of like an attack or something on her right cheek, um, cause her, or else it was just total, uh, total rotting from the water. Skin um, slippage is present on the chest, back, arms, left lower leg. The skin shows marked wrinkling of the palms, fingers, soles of feet and toes, the internal soft tissues and organs show um, a change and auto analysis. So I'm trying to find the other report from like an internal report. The last point of report that I found was basically the scene description, which talks about witness statements um, 
when she was last seen in location. And it does say that um, Sarah Lamb, her sister, began describing the following information, saying that her sister was um, had a history of depression and bipolar. She was currently taking four medications, Well, Wellbutrin, Lematerigen, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's spelled L-A-M-O-T-R-I-G-I-N-E, and then Quietapine, Q-U-E-T-I-A-P-I-N-E, -E, and then another one that she could not recall, but she said her sister had no su suicidal ideations or known prior attempts. I'm going to just be honest and say that if she had mental illness and she was staying at a severely haunted hotel, what I think happened was she got in the hotel. She was acting really neurotic and crazy on the tape that we saw when she was inside of the elevator. I think there was probably a possession that took place. And I think that she was probably sexually assaulted by somebody that was also staying at the hotel. Obviously a human. And I think they disposed of her in the water tank. That's what I think is what happened. For there to be forced trauma near her sexual organs, um, she was obviously sodomized. And I think she um, they, they got rid of her body immediately. And that's known for not being a safe area. I don't, I can't, I personally don't think I can conclude it being paranormal related. It's probably someone that knows the area, knows the hotel well, and that's why they were able to dispose of her for two weeks. And by that time, the person was already gone. I'm looking to see internal report and I can't seem to find it, but I did find the autopsy report form protocol of basically what they finalized it as. It says they finalized it as a drowning. It says that she had moderate decomposition, but she died of no trauma. And I guess I'm confused if that's the case. Why did they appear to find, um, you know, things around her sexual organs that clearly had been uh, mutilated? I don't understand what they're trying to hide. The report also says, um, this is from Investigating Agency of Los Angeles Police Department. Um, this is Investigator Tanel Stern's agency file. 130106275. It says that on February 19th, 2013, at 1636 hours, um, the coroner was notified um, to come basically get evidence. It says, I collected fingernail samples, cubic hair samples, and I also conducted a sexual assault kit. Um, so obviously they think something happened there. So that's interesting. Now, as far as Marty and Michael picking up, on something paranormal, seeing that they saw a pentagram, an upside down pentagram on the water tank. And as far as them saying that they don't know if it was a live being or, um, you know, like a being without a body that did this, it is probably what they were picking up on was the person that did this. May maybe they were possessed as well, or maybe they were sort of following in the footsteps of serial killers like Richard Ramirez and Jack. I think she was young. I think she was probably acting strange if her mental health wasn't good. I do think she was experiencing paranormal activity while she was there. I do believe she was playing the elevator game. However, I think someone was watching her and I think they saw her as a young, naive 20 something. They maybe even witnessed her having these communications with the other side. And I think they saw her vulnerable and that's when they decided to attack. Description as to where her remains were found to her material body. It says, scene narrative, water tank on rooftop. Scene temperature was regulated, question mark. It says no. Time observed was 1730. 1730 time is about 530 p.m., 5 p.m. Um, so this is interesting because like then they have like the anterior, posterior, the lateral, right, lateral, left, the hip, knee, ankle, the shoulder, jaw, wrist. And usually if there's any like obstructions on those areas, it would say it's all been left completely blank. Usually the coroner will also like circle an area of like where there was trauma on the body. There's nothing that's been circled. So apparently there's different degrees of rigor mortis going from zero, which is none, to four extreme. They actually didn't mark any of that, so that seems a little bit fishy to me. Um, I, I think that this coroner needs to be investigated. Um, or the city was just trying to like completely hide it under the, the rug because um, none, none of it's being properly marked. Okay, here's another page for, this is the first page I believe of the medical report and it says autopsy class A. What does that mean? Let's Google it. There are four top types of autopsies, forensic and clinical. 
there's different surgical procedures that they do to basically see like the extensiveness of um, forensic pathology, like what has happened to the body, either alive or in death. So they're saying that she was, um, she was, her autopsy was autopsy class A. So the actual autopsy was performed 2113. So that is th two or three days later than when the other report, initial report was done. They're saying there is a lot of scratches out on this, like I'm seeing. So it looks like they did two autopsies. They did one on 6-18-13 and another one. Wow, so the autopsies took four months to conclude. Does that sound right to you guys? Because it says that the date started was 2-21-13. Date completed was 6-18-13. So that was like four months. Let me see. How long does an autopsy take? An autopsy, a standard forensic autopsy will take two to three hours. Complex cases will, may take another additional two to three hours, but you cannot delay them usually because it will delay funeral arrangements. Why was this autopsy done for four months then? I have a lot of questions for the Los Angeles County Department who did this. Approximate interval between onset and death it says she died from ra immediate cause was drowning rapid drowning specifically so at first it was it was an accident then it says could not be determined then it says that was an error so the the accident was marked 6 18 13 the could not be determined was then marked 6 18 13 and then they went back and said it was an accident it said that in other natural causes how did the injury occur it says Hotel in water tank. Was operation performed for condition stated above? No. Type of surgery? None. There was a technician named L. Bivens. B-I-V-E-N-S. Let's just look up L. Bivens. It comes up as L.A. County Department of Medical Examiner and Coroner's Office. But Bivens is not there. There's no Bivens. Did they use a fake name when they were doing her technician? Wow, something's just not right here, guys. Okay, there's another section of this, too. It says, prior examination and review. Was there a body tag done? Yes. Was there an x-ray done? Yes. Was there at-the-scene photos? Yes, 23. So there's photos that exist of this somewhere. It says, case circumstances, body was decomposing. Then it says, the toxicology report. It was collected. It said that... Um, her stomach contents were there, her brain was there, her spleen was there, bile specimens were taken, liver specimens were taken, heart specimens were taken. They did not take kidney specimens or urine specimens. Is that because it had disappeared because she was in the tank? This, it says the toxicology specimens were, re, were collected by Tover, T-O-V-E-R, toxicology requests Screen C was requested. It said there was limited blood in her body. Requested material for pinning on case toxicology for a COD report. Now they're also saying on her medical report that she had bipolar disorder. Okay, so this is another interesting thing, just so you guys know. Eliza Lamb's parents tried to sue Hotel, and it says December 15th of 2015, um, this was written. It says a judge threw out the negligence suit filed by her parents, 21 student who was found dead inside a water tank in downtown Los Angeles in 2013. An L.A. Superior Court judge named Howard Halm, H-A-L-M, found that the Cecil Hotel could not have foreseen the death of the 21-year-old candidate Canadian tourist because it happened in the area where guests were not permitted. Lamb went missing January 31st of 2013 while visiting in Los Angeles. Her body was discovered on the roof's tank February 19th of 2013. This was after the hotel guests complained of poor water pressure, maintenance, and that the water tasted funny. Lamb's death was eventually ruled an accident with bipolar disorder, contributing factor, but no one still knows how she ended up in the tank. In order for Lamb to end up in the tank, she would have had to get onto the hotel roof, climb on the platform that held four tanks stacking on top of one another, climb a 10-foot ladder on the tank side, push open the 20 pound lid and then either fall or drop into the tank. Hotel guests are not permitted onto the roof and it's only accessible via one fire escape or a door that sounds an alarm 
when opened using a key and only hotel employees would have had access to that key. So see, that's fishy to me. Lamb's parents, David and Yina Lamb, filed the suit September of 2013. Thomas Johnson, their lawyer, argued that Elisa suffered from mental illness and she still might be alive if the water tanks would have been locked properly. So that was their suit. Quote, I noticed that the hatch to the main water tank was open. I looked inside and saw an Asian woman woman lying face up in the water approximately 12 inches from the top of the tank. Police had checked the roof during the investigation, but did not think to check the tanks, Lopez says. The hotel was built in the 1920s. It has over 600 rooms, and it's rebranded as the Stay on Main after her death. It was repurchased in 2014 by a New York, New York hotel guru named Richard Bourne, who intends to rebrand the entire hotel over the next two years. Bourne said when Cecil's new identity is complete, it won't be like the Ricks Carlton, but it's going to be a place you can stay for 150 night and profound. Everyone in downtown LA is going to want to charge 300 to 400 a night after they see how they like increase this. And it just talks about the hotel's dark past. Now going back to Eliza supposedly having bipolar disorder, I have lived with someone with severe bipolar one. People say like she's acting erratic on the elevator and like her hand did this weird thing and she's like jumping in and out. It was also claimed that she was playing the elevator game, which we're going to talk about that too. I'm going to tell you right now that even I have seen someone in a full state of manic multiple times. Mania happens when your brain starts firing off too many chemicals. It's sort of like having an adrenaline rush for a week, two, maybe three, and then they come down and they get depressed and sometimes they do become suicidal. If she was manic, she wouldn't have been acting like that. Like, I've seen full-blown manic episodes. That's not what manic episodes look like. A manic episode is, you think you're invincible? She would have been walking around really confident, like, yes, I can do whatever I want. She was, she was acting, like, neurotic, like, very strangely. That's not mania, even with bipolar. And even if she would have had a dip after mania, you literally become bed-bound when you're in a dip from manic episodes where you're so depressed you can't get out of bed. The energy that it would have taken for her to go up on the rooftop and crawl up a 10-foot ladder, once again, I have lived with someone with manic, like severe manic, severe bipolar one. I have witnessed somebody almost trying to kill themselves because of it. I know what mania looks like, and that is not a manic episode, I'm telling you guys. Um, and once again, the, the dip would not have been enough energy to go all the way up to the hotel roof to kill herself. That's absolutely ridiculous to me. Yes, she may have suffered from mental illness, but it is unrealistic to say that that was a manic episode. Now I have a list of deaths from the Cecil Hotel that I want to kind of talk about with the timeline of murders. So Elizabeth Short was the Black Dahlia. She was supposedly seen the day before um, her death and she was found cut in half. This was in January of 1947, so she has been linked to that. June 4th of 1964, Pigeon Goldie is when she um, passed away. She was found dead in her room. She was raped, stabbed, and beaten, and her room had been completely ransacked. Now, that doesn't include two other um, serial killers that were staying there, Richard Ramirez and Jack Unterweger. And um, I want to talk about him a little bit more, too, here in a little bit. Now, the other timeline of suicides and deaths, so, so you guys know. On November 19th of 1931, resident... W.K. Norton, 46, was found um, in his room after ingesting poisonous pills. He had, checked into the Sus he had checked into the Cecil Hotel under the name James Willie from Chicago, and it appears that he had planned his suicide to go there and actually kill himself. September of 1932, a maid found Benjamin. Um, he was 25 of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the head. He did not leave a suicide note. In late July of 1934, a former Army Medical Corps sergeant named Louis D. Borden, he was 53, he was found dead in his room in the Cecil. He'd had his throat slashed with a razor. He left several notes, one of which cited poor health was the reason of his suicide, so he killed himself. March of 1937, Grace E. Margo from the ninth story window she tried to commit suicide out of the ninth story. Her, her fall was broken by telephone wires, which were wrapped around her body. She later did die 
um, at the hospital, police were unable to determine whether her death was an accident or a suicide or if someone pushed her out the window. January of 1938, United States Marine Corps Fireman Roy Thompson, 35, jumped from the Cecil top floor. It was found on the skylight of the neighboring building. He'd been staying at the Cecil for several weeks. In May of 1939, Navy officer Erwin C. Neblet, 39, was found dead in his room after ingesting poison. What's with the, what's with the military guys getting attracted to this place to kill themselves? What's, what's with it? You, if you did more history, I bet you could dig up something. Like maybe a former owner was um, somehow had somebody linked to the military. Um, something is drawing military men to go here and kill themselves. January of 1940, teacher Dorothy Seeger, 45, ingested poison while staying at the Cecil. And she was reported um, to be near death when she was found. Um, no other reports were really reported about her condition. September of 1944, Dorothy Jean Purcell, 19, was sharing a room with her boyfriend, which is a shoe salesman. We saw this on Ghost Adventures. Ben Levine, 38. She'd apparently been unaware that she was pregnant. She went into labor. She later testified that she didn't want to interrupt her sleeping boyfriend. She ended up going into labor into the bathroom. She gave birth to a boy, thinking that the baby was dead. She threw him out the window and he landed on the roof of the adjacent building. That's just so God. Jesus, Lord. That's just... Woo! Purcell was charged with murder. Three psychiat psychiatrists did testify that she was mentally confused at the time of the incident. And then in January 1945, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. November 1947, Robert Smith, who was 35, died after jumping from the seventh floor windows. On October 22, 1954, a San Francisco employee named Helen Gurney, she was 55, she jumped from the window of the seventh floor and landed on and landed on the Cecil's marquee. We saw that in the Ghost Adventures episode. One week prior, she had registered through the hotel as Margaret Brown, so she gave them a fake name. On February 11th of 1962, Julia Frances Moore, 50, jumped from the window on the eighth floor and landed on the second story interior light well. She did not leave a suicide note. Among her possessions were a bus ticket from St. Louis, and it was 59 cents in the charge, and an Illinois bank book showing a balance of $1,800, but today that would have been worth about $15,000, so she wasn't broke. On October 12th of 1962, Pauline Ottman, 27, jumped out of the window of the ninth floor after an argument with her estranged husband, Dewey. He left the room prior to her suicide, and she landed on a pedestrian. George Gianni, 65, who was on the ground, it killed them both instantly. There were no witnesses. Police initially thought that... Um, Gianni and her committed suicide together. However, it was soon determined that Gianni had his hand in his pockets at the time of death. He was also still wearing shoes, which means he had not jumped. December 20th of 1975, a still unidentified woman, so she still hasn't been identified yet. She was about 23 years old. She jumped from the 12th floor window of the Cecil. She had registered to the hotel December 16th under the name Allison Lowell. She was staying in room 327. On September 1st of 1992, a man was found deceased in the alley behind the Cecil. Authorities believed that the, um, he'd either jumped or he was pushed from the fifth floor. At the time of his death, he was five foot five, uh, nine inches tall and weighed around 180 pounds. He was wearing blue sweatpants and a black sweatshirt over a gray t-shirt. The Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Coroner's Office placed his age at 20 to 23 years old. His true identity has never been established. On February 19th of 2013, Elisa Lamb was found inside the water tank. On June 13th of 2015, a body of a 28-year-old man was found outside of the hotel. Some believe that he committed suicide by jumping up out of the hotel's windows, although a spokesman for the county coroner says that the cause of death could not be determined. They get that a lot, don't they? Richard Ramirez, 1982 serial killer, 13 confirmed deaths dumped bloody clothing in the alleyway after each murder. I thought I would get more evidence from Eliza and um, Richard Ramirez. I'm not sure how much time they spent there investigating. I'm not sure how much of the evidence that we saw or how much we didn't see. 
I, I think this was one of the best episodes Ghost Adventures has had in a really long time. But those two, Richard Ramirez and Eliza Lamb, I really wish they would have gotten more information on. I love Michael and Marty Perry. I've seen them before. It's interesting because immediately um, Marty catches that like, there's a malevolent spirit inside of Richard Ramirez's old room. Michael says that Eliza was dead before they put her in the tank. Then Michael says whether they were alive or not in physical body, they knew to put her in here. So it's interesting because I also get the vibes that whatever killed her or removed her clothing was not of this world. Michael thinks that she was possessed, that she was act she was not acting normal. I agree, especially with her hands like this. Now I have said, in my opinion, there are two ways possession can happen. One, you want to experience it. Two, you're not in a good mental state and you should not be in that location because experiencing that paranoia and paranormal could cause you a problem if you are in a delicate mental state. If she did have bipolar, she probably shouldn't have been staying there, um, especially considering the long history of the Cecil Hotel and all of the deaths. Now the elevator game, um, they obviously thought that um, Eliza was playing the elevator game. Zach decides he's going to go play it by himself. I was so excited for this part. I'm so proud of him for doing it. I was hoping to God he was going to actually do it while he was there, and he did. Creepy thing before I talk about the elevator game is Eliza, um, they were in Eliza's room, and Richard is with Michael, and then Michael looks at um, Zach and says, he's here for you, tell Zach, hi, you got me. Okay, Mr. Night Stalker, creepy. But it's interesting because then Zach got the welt on his eye and it just continued to get worse and worse over time. Amazing that they documented it. Like, I feel like they really were in it to win it with this location. Um, Michael says that he swears he sees a pentagram on the water tank. Maybe that was during the time that Richard Ramirez was staying there. So now it's interesting because Aaron just doesn't look right. He keeps saying, I have rage. And he wants to basically fight Zach and Billy. There's light anomalies coming out of his head. That didn't act like Aaron. Like, I find Aaron to be, like, the most authentic out of everyone. He's irritable. He says he can't breathe from the mask, and he's just mad. Um, and I, I can't blame him for that. I did think it was interesting they caught a figure on the SLS on the elevator. And then Jay also, like, entered the elevator, and the other, uh, the other elevator next to it, like, opened by itself. I thought that was really creepy. Also, later, Zach got off the elevator, and it started, like, going up and down by itself. I thought that was strange. So, Zach, one thing he announced was our first part of our investigation was solely focused on the investigation of Elisa Lamb. But it wasn't, because you actually investigated Richard Ramirez as well. But then they did the part two, which is the other side of the haunting, which was talking about the Black Dahlia. They were talking about Jack Unterweger with the prostitutes. Um, and then the historian Scott Michaels steps in, and he's taking them to each room. They went to 704 with Helen Gurney. They went to 19... Um, they went to 712 with... Um, Jack Untegager, how we pronounce his name. So Zach, nothing really happened to him on the elevator other than he felt like a breeze come through. Obviously, he was definitely scared. I was shocked because I looked at the pamphlet paper they gave him of the instructions of the elevator game. That was not the full instructions. Like, if it would have worked, he did not have the instructions to get back down, so that was scary. Um, one thing that I thought was just, like, mind-blowing was... The photo they took of the man in the doorway, it was like a bald guy with no mask, a goatee, and it was mimicking Aaron. It was like a doppelganger of Aaron. I thought that was amazing. Like, one of the most amazing pieces of evidence. It's always when you're not expecting to catch it. Jay was in the basement. Obviously, he didn't find too much. Zach went to the seventh floor, which was the serial killer floor, which honestly, seventh floor had a lot of deaths going on. Billy was on the tenth floor with Goldie, where she was raped and murdered. Um, I like they put Billy there because Billy's kind of like the more soft-spoken one. He's been married the longest, so I think that was a good place for him to be. Aaron was on 14th floor of suicide. That made me nervous since they were doing B-roll, and he walked over to the window, and he was feeling rage. So I was kind of worried about him going up there alone. Aaron just didn't seem like himself there. He seemed like he was really struggling. There were a lot of screams they heard, which I thought were, like, amazing. And I thought it, the last thing I really wanted to talk about that was interesting was that Aaron set up two mirrors as portals. The first thing I want to say is that when you're using mirrors as a portal, that is witchcraft for sure. It's something they study not only in witchcraft, but also as a pagan. Um, you're using the rules about mirrors, you know, to the other side. Two mirrors facing each other 
can be dangerous. So I just want everybody to know that from home because you're just asking for infinity um, movement going on inside of these two, two mirrors. Two mirrors facing each other um, in plain sight, and if you stand between them, you, it's said that you can actually feel the energy flowing between them. Spirits and ghosts can enter your home using mirrors. They don't have, even have to face each other. You open them by going um, counterclockwise, and you close them by going clockwise. Um, so when you're cleaning, make sure you're not even accidentally opening the mirrors with like just a cleaner and a rag. So you're, you're basically talking about like interdimensional um, parallel universes, whatever's coming through. Um, you can also find images through doors such as Bella Lugosi's mirror. The truth about mirrors is you don't really know how deep they go when it is an actual portal. I actually have a mirror in my bedroom that I have had to close and I have to sage every four days because I figured out I was getting a lot of energies coming through it which was causing me nightmares. There's also those infinity mirrors where there's lights and you can just like the lights go into like a dark hole. I don't mess with those like at all. They sell them a lot in the beauty community and there's no way because that's that's literally like you're invoking a portal in your house. Now the closest thing you'll come to of being between two mirrors is like in a beauty salon right where you'll have like all of them set up which that can also be portals unfortunately. They call it actually like jumping dimensions, like it's possible to jump dimensions. Now the last piece of amazing evidence that Zach got, which there was a lot of evidence, it was an extra long episode. He was in Jack's room and um, you hear him say like, identify yourself, you know. All of a sudden you hear like, oh my God, he looks behind him and, and the water is running. Also Jack was coming through very clear, um, you know, through the uh, spirit box or the APF processor, P pb7 spirit box they had like created it was made by gary gaka hey gary gaka you want to make me one when zach's in room 712 jack says i'm jack it's super clear and then he said who are you touching and then jack says your mom which i thought was pretty funny the only complaint i have really is that i feel like we could have done more with eliza if i would have liked them to find out if marty and michael were right by saying eliza had been killed by like a um, a force that didn't have a physical body and that physical force put her in the water tank. I wish they would have gotten more evidence. Maybe Eliza's not there, I'm not sure. Maybe she's stuck, maybe she's trapped, maybe her soul is trapped. Um, so it's just interesting. I think they did a wonderful job. I just wish I could have seen a little bit more evidence. What did you guys think of the episode? I would love to hear in the comments below. I'm not going to be doing Ghost Adventures reviews like I used to do. I used to do them once a week. I'm not going to do that anymore. If you have any requests, please leave them below. I am happy to be back. Please make sure you're following me on social media so that you know what is going on because it, the channel, when it happened, was out of my control and only the people that follow me on Twitter and Instagram know what happened. So please leave me comments below. Please share my video if you wouldn't mind to try to get the channel up and running again. Please give my video a thumbs up because it also helps my traffic with YouTube. Um, I will be up next week, probably Thursdays, I think I'm going to do my uploads. And as always, I will catch you guys next time. Back, back, back from the dead.